Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this event presented in the American Inspiration Author Series. It's great to have you with us tonight in the land of history, exploring the North American West, the impact of settlers and mixed descent families. I'm Margaret Talcott, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. On your screen is the schedule for our hour long event featuring Anne F. Hyde and her remarkable new work, Born of Lakes and Plains. We're fortunate tonight that Dr. Hyde will present to us in full and with illustrations before taking your questions. Before we get started, some quick reminders for all of you out there. We are in a Zoom webinar format, which means that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We can't take your comments in the chat box, but do look there for relevant information and helpful links. We asked for your questions as you registered, and we've had fun going through those. If you have additional queries, though, please do enter them into the Q&A button launched from the bottom of your screen. You can put those questions in any time. Anytime something strikes you, we would love to address them, and we'll get to as many as we can. A video of tonight's program will be shared. The link will be Zoom emailed to you, kind of like the reminders you received. It will be emailed when it's available, the video, on the American Inspiration Video Archive. Uh, that will most likely happen tomorrow. Of course, the real pleasure comes, though, from reading the book, Born of Lakes and Plains. Copies can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Mass. Use the code AMINTS22 as you ordered, and the book you receive will be signed by the author on a book plate. Professor Hyde's work helps us to create a full picture of the North American West. The experience of settlers, Scotsmen, Brits, Frenchmen, and Spaniards, alongside the lives of native peoples, American Indians, and their shared descendants. Before we start in, a bit of background on our speaker. Anne F. Hyde is one of the foremost historians of the North American West. She is the author of Empires, Nations, and Families, a history of that region from 1800 to 1860. This remarkable work was the winner of the Bancroft Prize and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Hyde has authored, co-authored, and edited many acclaimed works. She's the professor of history at the University of Oklahoma and editor-in-chief of the Western Quarterly, the Western Historical Quarterly. And it is so great to have you with us. It is such an honor, uh, all of us East Coasters, and we wish you a really hearty welcome. Um, welcome aboard, and um, thanks for being here. Do you want to get started? Yep, I'm ready. So hi, everyone, and thanks so much, Margaret. I'm really happy to talk about this book to people in Boston, but also to folks who are spread everywhere. So my plan is um, I'm going to tell you why I want to tell this story and how the book is set up and then introduce you to some of the families. So I'm going to show some images and some maps to you just so you know who's who and where they lived. And then I'm going to read a couple of sections just to give you a quick tour of the book that way. So let's get started with sharing my screen so you can see my slides. Okay. Always a relief when it works. So the book has a very simple structure, but it reveals so many complicated stories that are really all worth untangling. So it covers 400 years and five families who begin in the fur trade and eventually spread everywhere. And this map shows the big range of places they went. And a lot of those names were certainly familiar to me when I started this research, um, but I feel quite at home in this map um, now. So this focuses on families, but it also brings in all the big US history and Western stories, but it keeps those stories quite personal and intimate. So, you know, here, when I was doing the research for my last book, Empires, Nations and Families, which focused on the whole West, but on a tight period between 1800 and 1860, I kept finding these mixed descent families everywhere. They were running businesses, staffing forts, guiding and advising Western explorers, paddling boats, and serving in the US Army. But by 1900, 
that proud mixing became illegal and all of these people disappeared. It became a shameful heritage that people hid. So because really understanding how race works in US culture just seems to be the itch I can't stop scratching. I began this project with some big questions. You can see those up there. So first, I needed to figure out where all these families came from and why all this mixing started. And focusing on the long history of the fur trade seemed like a good place to start. The fur trade created the largest set of business records in the 18th and 19th century North America. And those materials expose all the daily decisions that built a business that literally marries European and indigenous practices. And second, rereading all those records allowed me to explore how indigenous and European communities made families that really thrived on all these rivers that link the fur trade in North America. And that lasted for nearly 300 years. So what happened to these successful families and why? And then finally, how could this long story of family making help native nations in America now? There are really bitter divisions over tribal membership, blood quantum, and native people's right to define who they are in Indian country today. Now, intermarriage can actually destroy indigenous nations because it can reduce blood quantum, which is that measure invented by racist scientists to root out mixed blood people from US society. So that's um, the thing that sort of drove me to ask all these questions. So here is our first family. I have some names up there um, and a map so you can keep track of all this. So let's see if my pointer thing works. We're gonna be talking about this area up here. Um, sort of where all of the Great Lakes connect and this important family who lived there. So the book really begins by considering how Native Americans made choices about trade, conquest, marriage, and dealing with trouble. And I'm going to read a little bit from chapter one, where we meet an Irish immigrant named John Johnston, who came to Lake Superior and made a life in the fur trade. So why would an important Ojibwa family be living in a place haunted by Ojibwa ghosts? Wabojik, faced with population loss because of disease and war with Dakotas, gambled on a move to a place that had been powerful for his people. He made that decision in concert with another local family, the French Canadian Cadots, who had intermarried with Ojibwa women from Wabajik's family for two generations. As this partnership flourished, linking new families and vanquishing old ghosts, perhaps La Pointe would be safe. And here's La Pointe, that little point right up here. So right in the middle of Lake Superior. It was not safe for Greenhorn John Johnston. When his last French paddler abandoned him in February of 1791, Johnston set out to find his neighbors. He got lost and probably would have perished in the cold if Wabajig's eldest son hadn't found him. Because his feet were nearly frozen, Johnston spent several weeks recovering. He learned about native life and learned some Ojibwa, all from Wabajig's daughter, a 14-year-old named Oshagush Kotawekwe. By May, Johnson had a powerful personal relationship with Wabojik and his family. When the streams opened up and it was time to return to Michelmackinac with all the furs he'd gotten from Wabojik's band, Johnson asked for his daughter's hand. Wabojik refused. He wanted to make sure that Oshibush Kodawekwe was willing. So that summer of 1792, she made an isolated fast and waited for a dream. She described that dream years later to a visiting English writer. A white man had approached her with a cup in his hand saying, you poor thing, why are you fasting? Here's food for you. In her dream, the white man was always accompanied by a dog who looked into her face as if he knew her. This dream satisfied Oshawish Kotawekwe that the white stranger was a guardian rather than a threat. Still, a fur trade marriage required personal bravery to leap over that shared over that lack of a shared culture. Johnston spent that same summer paying off his debts and purchasing wedding presents for Wabajik's family. John had a ring made of blue enamel with seed pearls that enshrouded a lock of his hair. A ring made with human hair was not a usual gift for an Ojibwa bride, a thing made of 
human remains with bad luck and inconvenient as she used her hands to gather rice and braid hair. She never wore it on her finger, but tucked it into a beaded deerskin pocket. After their fall marriage in 1792, the first weeks together were not easy. Suddenly, 15-year-old Oshagush Kutawekwe was Susan Johnston. Many years later, Susan told her daughter Jane about finding herself in a strange house. She crept into a corner and wept. Hoping to comfort her, John lit a fire in the stove, but the leaping flames and roaring sound terrified her. She ran back to her grandfather's lodge, just across the creek from Johnston's house. She begged her father to end the marriage. Furious and ashamed, Wabajik dragged her back to Johnston's house. As she told it later, Johnston showed great patience. He allowed her to stay in a corner, covered her with a blanket, and offered her food, just like the white man in her vision from the summer before. A few days later, she felt able to face her situation. So young Oshagush Kotawekwe became Susan, pinned her braids back with the ivory comb that Johnston had given her and went about the, about the ordinary tasks of an Ojibwe woman. So this is that same family in the next generation. And here we have, this is daughter Jane. And that's, this is a painting that's on a tiny locket made about 1815. And then right next to her is her husband, Henry Schoolcraft. Now all these people look serious because 19th century um, images are made to look that way. But the Johnston and Schoolcraft family are more like a tragic opera. Um, this is the middle son, George. And then the middle daughter, Charlotte, and her family from about 1850. Um, and my favorite tiny image is right here. And this is, this is a little drawing that's very typical of um, treaties. So instead of a signature, people will draw their um, family name. And this is what we see here. So the obvious question is, why are those cranes wearing plaid? So of course, this band of Ojibwas signing a treaty in the 1840s, which was translated by George Johnston above, all of these Ojibwas have Scottish kin. So that's how they sign it. So I'm gonna read a little bit more about Jane Johnston and Henry Schoolcraft later. So this is kind of what's happening in the 1830s. Watching the Johnstons struggle to find middle-class respectability increased Henry's anxiety about his children. Jenny and John's uncles, George, William, and John Johnston, well-educated with powerful families, continued to hope that just a little more cash or luck would make them succeed, but they struggled. Jane, Charlotte, and Anna Maria did better than their brothers because they had white husbands who could provide them with protection in this increasingly unfriendly world. They prayed about how Indian their children would look and how they would proceed through their lives in Michigan as it became a US state. Facing such new realities, the school crafts took their children east to find suitable schools. In December of 1838, Henry reported that the family had stopped in Princeton, New Jersey and left Johnston at the Round Hill School. The next day, Jane, Henry, and Jenny went to Philadelphia to visit the Academy of Natural Sciences where Dr. Samuel George Morton's extensive collection of Indian crania was displayed. They left Jenny at the private school of the Mrs. Guild, South 4th Street in Philadelphia. While Henry switched easily from measuring Indian crania to considering his children's minds, Jane felt the loss deeply. She composed an elegy entitled, On Leaving My Children, John and Jane, at School in the Atlantic States. It began in Ojibwa, my cow e yon in, or my heart fills with pleasure and throbs with fear. So that was the first family and really the first two families. So the Johnstons and Oshibush Kotawekwe's Irish and Ojibwa family. And then we moved to the Pacific Northwest because um, we're following the big British fur companies. And then there's another set of families who are on the, along the Missouri River with us, which is really the heart of the US fur trade. 
And then finally, we move south and west to the border of Mexico to the fifth family, which is where native people and wh white traders run the bison and hide trade. So it's, different, it's a different kind of fur trade, but a fur trade um, as well. And every single one of these families stood at the heart of imperial battles over the fur trade. What it was like to feel the extensions of American authority west of the Appalachians, the ravages of disease and the violence of Indian removal. Then after the Civil War, they faced the disasters of reservation policy and allotment, as well as the pseudoscience of blood quantum that made allotment work. So here's our third and fourth family. So we have one Irish American and one young French refugee from New Orleans. And they head up the river in 1820. So Andrew Drips and Lucienne Fontenelle become important mountain, Rocky Mountain fur traders. And really they're successful because of their wives' connections. Drips marries an Oto woman, Macampame, and Fontenelle marries an Omaha woman. And they're all partners in the Missouri River trade world. The Drips are quite successful but the Fontenelles have a rough path through the 19th century. And the portrait over there is one of Macompomay's clan members who actually visited Washington DC in 1820. So women's actions really ground this part of the book. I'll show you some more pictures of these people. So we have Louise Giroux, who is of Dakota and French heritage, born in 1830. And she is fur trader Andrew Drip's second wife. So he's the fur trader who went in 1820 up the river with Lucienne Fontenelle. And she, so she's his second wife. And these women over here are Andrew Drip's Oto daughters with Macompomay. Um, and this, I love this picture of these three generations that was taken about 1890. So these are two older Oto women who have become Kansas pioneers in the process. And these women have 22 children with seven different husbands. So, you know, think about an ancestry.com family tree trying to manage all that. These women all co-parent with their sisters and native families to protect access to land. And they're concerned about land, whoops, which is on the, um, Okay, here we go. Um, they're concerned about land that's on the, the half-breed tract. So this is the half-breed reservation, which is on the Great and Little Nimaha rivers. And this is what they invest in when the fur trade begins to wane after the Civil War. And there are 54 similar tracts like this of special land for mixed blood families that's carved out in treaties. And then the next family, and we're gonna, this is in the Pacific Northwest. Now the point of this sort of very detailed map of Canada, um, which is a Hudson's Bay Company map made in 1860 are these little red dots. So all these little red dots and writing are forts that are built or bought by the Hudson's Bay Company, which is an enormous corporate employer um, throughout the 19th century. So as Hudson Bay Company employees, the Mackays, and here is um, Margaret Kimball Mackay. Um, they made a life in this region and in the fur trade. Mixed descent families had access to educations, language and resources that not all of their native kin had. So here's a picture of William Mackay who is Chinook, Cree and Anglo. He was sent east to a boarding school in Fairfield, Connecticut and got a medical degree. He and his brothers became scouts in Oregon's terrible Indian Wars in the 1850s, and they married women from other fur trade families. And that image is of William, his brother and son from about 1880. So here's just a little piece of William's story. One spring day in 1870, William Cameron Mackay, physician on the Warm Springs Reservation, Oregon, went into town to vote. He'd voted in many elections since the 1840s, but this time James Campbell, Mackay's neighbor and a local election judge stopped him. Campbell claimed that as quote, a half breed Indian, Mackay was not entitled to vote. Feeling confident of status, born in Oregon, elected to the local office and having served in the US Army, William Mackay sued the election official for denying his rights as a citizen. The suit and countersuits wound through the court system. 
For William, the issue was being refused the right to vote on account of his being an Indian. Since he wasn't an Indian, but a half breed, according to Oregon law, he was entitled to vote and to own land. Given that legal status, McKay wanted to vote to vote and to receive $500 for his trouble. So William lined up experts to dispute his status as an Indian. He laid out his personal history to demonstrate his blended heritage, but his strategy backfired when the judge did some fancy racial math. The judge calculated that because William's father had a half-breed mother and become, because William's mother was a full-blooded Chinook, he was 9 sixteenths Indian eight of which he gets from his Chinook mother and the other one from his Canadian father. Fractions of blood added up to make William in legal contemplation an American Indian and not an American half-breed entitled to vote in Oregon. William appealed and the district court agreed that that racial math didn't matter. Instead, the legal issue became that neither William Mackay nor his father Thomas Mackay had ever been naturalized under the laws of the United States. Thomas had arrived in Oregon before it was a US territory. As a mixed blood Canadian, he married a Chinook woman and they had children in Oregon when it was controlled by Britain. So William, born in 1824, wasn't an American. The last place and last family is far is far to the south and quite a different area. So while the Drips run the Rocky Mountain fur trade and the Mackays staff forts in Oregon, at the same moment, St. Louis and William Bent and his brothers enter a new world on the Arkansas River in partnership with the Southern Cheyennes, Arapahoes, and Comanches. And the, this wistful, poignant member memory in this ledger drawing, which is about marriage and bison and a Southern Cheyenne world, a world that had disappeared. So it's, it's done by a prisoner in the Fort Marion prison. Um, but this is this world that everyone's in, imagining. So I'm gonna read a little bit about that marriage. In the summer of 1835, William Bent and Miss Danta married. Miss Danta, the 17 year old daughter of the arrow keeper of the Cheyenne and William Bent, the 26 year old son of a St. Louis judge joined lives in a great public ceremony. They bound two networks of relations, siblings, parents, aunts and uncles and in-laws into extended family obligations. The marriage promised Miss Dante's father, White Thunder, prestige and wealth, which he could use to find safety amidst Pawnees, Kiowas and Comanches. And here's some pictures as I read. Marriage ensured that William Bent would care for his Cheyenne relatives and that Yellow Wolf and White Thunder's families would protect Bent's family. When she appeared at the marriage ceremony, probably carried in by her uncles, Miss Danta wore Cheyenne clothing. She wore a soft, nearly white buckskin dress belted with a leather and brass sash, ornamented with silver beads and elf teeth. She wore a symbolic chastity belt under her clothing, a knotted rope that hung between a young woman's legs until she chose to take it off. Miss Danta and William lived much of the time in a bison skin lodge located in the center of the Cheyenne village. The couple also spent time inside the fort and Miss Danta redecorated William's round floor quarters to suit her tastes. She soon shared both spaces with her two sisters, Island and Yellow Woman. They were co-wives to William, as suited his elite status in the Cheyenne tribe. This shocked some Anglos, but few dared comment in William's presence. The Cheyenne felt safe in the great cultural hinge that was Bent's fort. Mary Bent, Oka, her birth was followed by her siblings, Robert, George, Julia, and Charles, and that those births offered hope that that hinge would stay open for years. The peoples and villages who traded bison skins with the Bent and St. Brain Company became wealthy with guns and horses. But wealth, once created, then had to be protected. White merchants in New York, New Orleans, and St. Louis sent smooth bore shotguns by the hundreds of thousands into the hands of native people on the Southern Plains. Much like Mackinac, Fort Vancouver, or Bellevue, Bent's Fort was a cosmopolitan place built by the mixed blood families of the fur trade. So the last third of the book 
is really what happens to all of these families and ideas as 19th century concerns about citizenship and race evolve during this long era of Indian War. And the book follows all families, it's all five of them, but I'm gonna finish up here with a little bit of the Bent story. So in Indian territory that becomes Oklahoma, we're gonna follow George Bent and his, five, and his four wives, He's got two Cheyenne wives, one Arapaho wife and one Ute wife, and their children through life in Indian territory. So after the Indian Wars of the 1860s and 1870s, really no native people can be tolerated in Colorado or Utah. So everyone, including the wealthy and powerful Bents, is driven to Indian territory with absolutely nothing. George George Bent sells guns, liquor, and he makes bad land deals. And when native nations had their cattle, horses, bison, and land stolen over the course of the 19th century, fights over dwindling resources made tribal politics bitter. George, kind of deservedly, gets shunned as an untrustworthy Cheyenne, a viho or white spider. And the image in the corner shows George Bent's oldest daughter, Ada Bent, and her husband, Robert Left Hand, and those are both in their boarding school pictures. And then this map of Indian country with reservations, boarding schools and railroads from about 1890. And now I'm gonna read just a little bit from the end. So by 1880, two centuries of treaty making and two decades of Indian war had left illegal morass of unfulfilled treaties and failed policy initiatives. The people who managed reservations, Christian reformers and federal officials, and the people who lived on them, indigenous people and their friends and business partners, really could not agree about how native nations should join modern America. Where did indigenous Americans fit in the evolving racial hierarchy? Did native people, so recently at war with the US and so recently pushed onto reservations, still threaten America? When Ada Bent returned home after two years at the Carlisle Indian School, she lived with George and Standing Out Woman. She saw Cheyennes and Arapahoes facing an impoverished reservation life and at the end of Plains warfare. Poverty meant that chiefs couldn't give enough gifts to maintain power. Without feats of bravery in battle, young men couldn't become adults. Without gifts and horses, poor parents couldn't celebrate sons or marry off daughters. Marriage or adoption no longer seemed worth it. People ended up without husbands, wives, children, or sisters. An old Cheyenne woman named Singing Grass lived all alone, a shocking situation in a Cheyenne community. She reported to the census taker in 1890 that every one of her nine children had died, stark evidence of how difficult those years were. The fur trade and the communities that came out of it comprised a cornucopia of family types, including serial monogamy, polygamy, men or women co-parenting. As such families became illegal in Indian country and in the rest of the United States, they just went underground. A range of families enabled Southern Cheyennes to outlast allotment. Three women could raise cattle and two women could raise children. So the book ends in that hard moment when mixed descent families hid their heritage and sometimes lost it. And those flexible, adaptive, blood mixing families really had to disappear in the context of 20th century racial ideas. But People survive, they travel, they pass, they move to reservations, they hide their stories, but they continue to mix both blood and culture. So I'm gonna stop here and turn it back over to Margaret. And then I'm really eager to answer your questions about all this. And that was so interesting. And I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, it was a remarkable sweep of history um, for me. Um, I am not as familiar with um, the American West, the North American West. And really you took us all the way down to St. Louis and all the way up to the Hudson's Bay forts and um, to Tennessee, out to Nevada, up to Pacific Northwest. It was just a remarkable review of what happened um, over the last 400 years. And I really thank you 
for that education. Um, I am just a medium for your questions, folks out there. So please, if you have questions, put them into the Q and A button um, because I'm I'm just I'm serving your questions up. Uh, a lot of folks have questions on frontier family making, um, how that came about. How one person asked, how did families begin? Were they arranged marriages? Were folks carried off? Who decided? Who was free to decide? And were these love marriages, or was it? In my what I add here is it was England and France marrying for lands. Um, tell us a little more. That's that's a that's a great question, and the the sort of simple answer is all of those things are true um, because because we have to think about marriage in two really different ways. It's it's diplomatic. So it is like, you know, England and Spain, you know, marrying off princesses, but it's also very much about people making new alliances when they're in trouble. So this very much comes out of a long period of warfare in the 17th and 18th century, when native people used marriage as a strategy to make new alliances with new tribal nations, with, with colonial people. So, you know, marrying outside of your tribe was common. It was you know, viewed as being helpful. Um, the, other, the other piece of that was, okay, so suppose you get married off or carried off, which certainly happened, um, and you don't like that person. You're not stuck with them for life because these, these are diplomatic marriages. So a young couple could say, oh, you know, we're not getting along. Maybe we're not the best match. So, you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to last forever. So especially for women, their most important relatives weren't their new spouses. It remained their, you know, in Ojibwa families, as an example, remained their, you know, brothers and fathers much more than their husbands. Another question that a lot of folks are asking which in which um, white men were most likely to re, to marry um, were the the French traders um, are uh, how common were French people marrying um, French traders um, the English I understand married less often than the French traders so can you characterize by um, ethnic origin uh, men who were more likely to intermarry. The, the, the standard story is exactly that, that it's, it's more typically French people who are more likely to marry. And that had to do with the way the French Catholic Church worked. It had to do with settlement histories where many, many British people initially came in family groups. But, but really, if you take a step back, um, especially in the early period, any place there, I'm, I'm generalizing a little, but any place there are a whole bunch of men and they don't have women, um, they marry into native groups. So you know, British men do it, Irish men do it, French men do it, Spanish men do it, because it, it makes sense, um, particularly if you want to participate in the fur trade. So you could not make a relationship with a band that would work with you to get furs if you didn't have a personal family relationship. So it's just, it's the key to doing business in the fur trade. Uh, question, are there interactions between Canadian and American tribal groups? And that's an interesting question uh, when that 49th parallel came along, but a question for, on that topic. Yeah, that, I mean, and that's part of it there. I mean, for most of the period um, that I take these families through, the, the 49th parallel was not really an issue. And there's all, because of, you know, resources. So for example, bison. Um, people move up and down the Great Plains, which goes all the way into the Canadian Shield and all the way south into Texas, um, hunting bison. Once they have horses that they get from the Spanish in the you know, 1700s and 1800s, it gets easier to hunt bison, but they've been doing that all along. So, and again, this is one of those strategies, families, native families intermarry with each other as a way to recover from losses from epidemic disease or from warfare. So it's very common to see these groups intermarried. And you know, people will introduce themselves by saying, I'm a Cree woman, but I have an Assiniboine, you know. So so you know, people will talk about their 
um, family pass that way. Another question that came in live, what percentage of native populations were involved in these marriages? That's a really good question. And it's, it's um, early on um, in the fur trade, some, some tribal groups were much more involved in the fur trade than others. So the Cree were very involved in the fur trade from the beginning. Um, the Ojibwa are another example of a group that got interested in the fur trade. And so there's a significant portion of those um, tribal groups who ha are intermarried. One way to look at that is some tribal nations develop specific clans for mixed descent people. So, you know, I showed the picture of the um, crane clan with the, you know, little plaid suits on. Um, there's there are many tribes have a clan like that to solve the issue of mixed blood children. But the other piece to think about is um, they no one sees race in the same way that 19th and 20th century census takers do. So you know who's who is much harder to tell. When I started really looking carefully at um, the records in Oklahoma with the Ben family or with Ojibwa records um, in Michigan in the you know, 1880s and 1890s. In many places, it's up to a quarter of a tribe. But that's, that's a white census taker making that judgment. So it, you know, I, don't, I don't know quite what to believe about that. Another question we've gotten in live, um, what role did women in these marriages play other than bearing mixed race children? Did any of them become traitors? Did any of them serve diplomatically or fulfill other roles? So, yes, women are always diplomats in these situations. So, you know, it, it, there, there are several examples of this kind of thing. On the Southern Plains, many, many tribal nations would send women out to treat with any new visitor who came by because they could figure out who the strangers were. They were less likely to start a little fight. Um, so women often act as diplomats in that kind of situation. Um, having, having sex is sort of less of a big deal. Um, that's, you know, part of what people do to have good luck before hunts, to um, celebrate a feast with other people. There is absolutely rape in captivity. So there is, you know, violence out there around this world. Um, but women could say yes or no to these marriages. Um, but they got, they got advantages from them. So they got resources for their families, things that their families needed. They, they got trading relationships. They got trading goods. Um, so you know, there's a benefit that comes out of this but it's complicated. Another advanced question. How did the indigenous men, fathers, brothers feel about native women mixing with white men? I guess if sex is no big deal, then that maybe doesn't matter, but. Well, if you, if you think about marriage and alliance making as the way you make your way in the world and the way you make your way in a changing world. So if you wanna deal with you know, whatever threat is coming down the pike, whether it's that, um, you know, Iroquois raiders have just taken a huge number of your men, um, or if a huge number of your people have just died from smallpox. The way to solve that problem is to bring new people in the tribe, which means bringing in, you know, men who are gonna marry women so it, 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 it makes a certain sort of economic and social sense. Agreed. Uh, question coming in live. Are there detailed tribal records about these mixed marriages across the broad spectrum of American indigenous people? Are these being digitized or made available online for research if they do exist? 
they 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 do exist. The the problem is the the moment that all this record keeping starts being you know really important is the moment when uh, Indian people are allotted, which means they're put on reservations and they are um, given chunks of land off you know for, from the places they had already you know been for a very long time. So an Indian reservation or Indian lands and area is divided up and people are given individual plots of land. And the idea is the tribal relationship will be over. Um, the US government will no longer be in charge. So in order to do that, the US census begins to have to figure out who is native and who's not. So there's a huge effort to get people to sign these allotment rules, which are called the Dawes rules after Senator Henry Dawes. Um, but this is really a forced effort. So you can, so again, who's keeping the record? So someone comes down the road and says, we want you to sign on the dotted line here and then explain what your Indian blood quantum is. Are you a full blood? Are you a half breed? Are you a quarter Indian? And this is someone who doesn't speak any native languages. Uh, and they're just guesstimating on the spot about who's who. So the Dawes rolls are there and they're unbelievably detailed, but are they right? And every, every tribe has a moment like that. A question about um, stigmatization of mixed marriage. And um, we've got both sides of it here. Um, one questioner says, when did mixed marriages stop being illegal? And when did being a, of mixed descent no longer seem to be stigmatized, but even romanticized? And then another questioner asks, uh, at what point in history for these mixed marriages, um, were they most um, comfortable and happy being um, American, what policies over time have made this uh, a good environment for them? Maybe, maybe I'll start backwards. So uh, the question about which policies worked, I don't think any government policies really ever did. I think this is all about business. So when the Hudson's Bay Company wanted to run a fur trade efficiently, um, they needed a stable workforce on the ground. And the only way to get a stable workforce was to hook in all these young men that they kind of dragged off the docks in London or Ireland or Montreal and set them up with native women to make these you know, essential fur trade relationships. So native women you know, ran forts. So all these fur company forts had, you know, families living in them. Women provided food, women provided clothing for people. So their services really were essential through that whole period. And it that extends into the sort of, from the traditional fur trade, when, you know, we're talking about beaver and otters and all that sort of thing, into the bison trade. So again, it's women organizing all that labor. Um, and it's, it's once that business ends, which is in the late 19th century, that those relationships and that labor isn't essential anymore. And, but all these families exist and there are all these people who have made these decisions. So, you know, then it get then it gets messier. The, the other piece, and this goes, I think really to the first question is, that does get romanticized. So, you know, in the 1830s, 1840s, when um, Americans first learn about the fur trade, there are all these explorers who go out there to, you know, go on a fur trade rendezvous and have this, you know, romantic encounter with native people. And there's, you know, maybe they'll be able to get a beautiful Indian maiden to come into their tents for the rendezvous. So there's all this notion about this kind of fantastic, um, romantic view of what's going on with these rendezvous. And th those could be very violent moments for Indian women. Um, tribes wanted to trade there, but they wanted to keep people safe so that they would often camp a certain distance away because that could be trouble sometimes. So, you know, there are beautiful paintings that, you know, the Indian women 
the Trapper's Bride is a really famous 19th century painting. So there's certainly that very romantic vision of all that. But that changes as the 19th century ends, the 20th century appears. So, you know, the, somebody asked, so when does this end? And that is a really excellent question because I think people romanticize that there's less racial stigma around native people than black people. But I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that's true. It depends on where you live, um, what kinds of histories people had together. Um, I, I hear stories all the time in Oklahoma. And this is just, you know, a single generation away about growing up in the 1960s and 1970s and, you know, people being taunted for being a half breed in classrooms. So, you know, that's, it's not illegal anymore. Yeah. But it's still, there's still a stigma. We've got a couple questions on language. Uh, I'll read you two of them. Did the fur traders speak the native language? And did the natives speak English? How did they communicate? And then another question, are you surprised by the linguistic skills of these folks you write about? So many who are fluent in three, four or more languages, including indigenous languages and dialects. Well, the second question sort of answers the first one. So if you, if you think about um, people in this situation trying to participate in the fur trade, it's like, people who are really, really, really excellent tour guides when you go to Europe. And it's amazing because they're a tour guide because they can speak all these languages and provide entree into all these places. And, and that's what traders are doing. So they, they need to be able to talk to their customers. There are a bunch of um, sort of pigeon languages that, you know, sort of fur trade dialect. So Chinook sometimes is called a dialect that it really um, covers the entire Pacific Northwest. So people can speak sort of a little bit of this kind of common language to get by in the fur trade. <clears throat> but I'm not, they do speak a lot of languages. And if you're a fur trade kid, you're gonna learn native languages and you know, French and English and Spanish. Um, fewer women are literate, but you know a lot of boys are because that's kind of the path to success in the fur trade world is to be a, a trader who can run a fort and need to be literate. A question that came in early, what are the signs in census, marriage, birth records and the like? What are the signs that an individual is indigenous? Well, if you can tell me that, I'll hire you as a research assistant, because boy, um, as I mean, everyone in this audience knows this. If you've looked at the census, it every single year the categories change and how people have recorded changes because the American government is interested in something else. So Indian people aren't even noted in the census really until um, after 1870. But um, census takers put it in there all the time. So, so I was looking at, this is you know from the 1860s in the Pacific Northwest. And the two choices are B and W, which I think are black and white. And the census taker writes in I and H, B, H, B. So I and H, B in all these categories. And you know, so you know, maybe I'm making too many assumptions because there's only two choices, but I think that's Indian and half breed that the, the, this guy has made a choice about entering the census. So, you know, after 1880 and um, we get rid of Indian treaties and there's a discussion about Indian citizenship, then they appear on the census in a different way. Another question in early, and this person clearly knows a lot about your other works. Um, how did these interesting people you write about keep bumping into each other across the vast spaces of the 18th and 19th century West? Is it that the trails are few and far between and thus they increase the odds of finding one another? And well, they do bump into each other and they, and they know each other. 
um, I mean, some of these guys who work for the Hudson's Bay Company really, I mean, they, they kind of move up corporate ladders. So they, you know, run into each other in various places as businessmen. But the other kind of really basic answer, if you think about it, um, forts, which are built by trading companies and the U.S. Army are built at very strategic places. So they're, you know, where rivers come together, where people are going to need, you know, help along the trail. And there are hundreds of forts. So that is where people run into each other. So there is literally this kind of locus of places that people are going to run into each other. Going back to perceptions, uh, uh, someone has a question about the Civil War and the impact of that Civil War era on perceptions of race and discrimination. What was the effect of the Civil War on the Indians, American Indians at the time? Um, so so the, the, the answer to that question really has more to do with Reconstruction. Um, and Reconstruction is one of these moments where this unbelievably self-confident new federal government combines with unbelievably self-confident missionary reformers. And they sweep into Indian country after the Civil War. And that's the big era of, we're gonna put everyone on reservations. Um, we're going to train them so that they sort of at least look enough like white citizens that maybe they could work as servants or caretakers or nurses. Um, but very much, the, you know, the, the only path is assimilation into white society. So that's a big shift after the Civil War. And it is this particular super self-confident moment around Reconstruction. Going back in time, how did the Indian Removal Act of 1832 impact these Metis or mixed race families? Well, almost all of the leadership in the um, tribes that were removed were mixed race families. They came from trader families. Um, so, you know, the Cherokee, the Choctaws, the Chickasaw, we can go down the list there. Um, they, a lot of them have, you know, Scottish last names for the same kind of reason I described. And they, because of that history, um, they, they're educated, they, you know, appreciate the written word, they make deals with government officials. So they're both uh, hated um, when removal unfolds because, you know, they, they kept promising this wouldn't happen and then it did. Um, and they're the people who end up having to, you know, sort of set up shop in this new place. And they, they do have more wealth and power. And some of them get killed as a result of all this. So, you know, that's, you know, one of these hard histories that spins up from the 1830s. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Does the book discuss these marriages, fur trade, through the lens specifically of colonial oppression? Yes, so two things are always going on at once in, in the book or and probably in my head. So there absolutely is this colonial world that's coming like a steamroller. And it, it takes different guises in the 18th century and the 19th century. Um, Native people are gonna be, you know, steamrolls by this and it's going to be damaging you know population loss is epic but at the same time what i'm interested in is you know why at the end of that native people have survived what were the strategies that allowed them to you know survive this colonial process which did not have their interests at heart their their brief moments like the fur trade um, when the colonial projects needs them, but they don't last very long. So, you know, making kin, making relationships across borders are all strategies that help native people survive. But it's an, you know, it's, it's, it's an ugly story for sure. A last question here. Ms. Hyde has such extensive knowledge of the topic. Does she have any native heritage or is this purely an academic interest? 
So, you know, no one has ever asked me that question before. Um, quite, a, quite in that way. Um, I, I do not have any native heritage, but when I, when I started this project, um, this was right when, you know, all those tests, you know, 23 and me, all those things came out. I taught a class where we all took the test to sort of unpack the results together. And I, I did that as part of that class. But now having, having done this research and being a little skeptical of what those test results mean, I, I don't think I have native heritage, but I'm not gonna say 100% sure that I don't. Um, I said at the beginning that the, the itch that I've always been trying to scratch is sort of how race works. And because I've always lived in the West and I grew up here, um, figuring out what that racial lens looked like for indigenous people, which is kind of the way I went about that. Well, we are so grateful to you for taking this time to do this research and to talk to us about this book. Um, so thank you. And as we do for all of our authors in the American Inspiration Author Series, um, Professor Hyde, we would love to have you read uh, briefly from the book. I know you have a paragraph to share. So um, over to you for some closing moments and closing thoughts. Thank you. And this, these are literally last words right from the epilogue of the book. These particular stories of mixing heritage begin with the fur trade, but spread far beyond as frontier family making became part of every American history. Sometimes human need led to violence as women were taken captive or raped, but for most women and men, mixing blood and sharing households was a means to stand fast and protect children and communities. So thank you. Thank you for those words. Um, that was such hard work, surviving and thriving um, for American Indians and for all these mixed families. Our challenges today are so much smaller, um, but hard to, especially for certain communities. So thank you for taking us back through time and showing us um, what was and what is. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount from your book and from your presentation. As a reminder to our audience, copies of Anne's book, Born of Lakes and Plains, are available from Porter Square Books. This insightful history of our country could be a perfect gift for Father's Day or Mother's Day. If you order online using the code AMINTS22, you will get a signed copy. Um, order soon as the books will go out later this week or next. Moving toward closing, we at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have presented tonight's author talk. For those of you who don't know much about us at NEHGS, if you're researching a community or a family, we could be the perfect partners and helpers. You'll find our library and education center useful. The stacks on Newbury Street are now open to the public and NEHGS members can delve into our digital archives anytime, gaining access to 1.4 billion searchable family records. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists, our Brew Family Learning Center hosts many great educational programs aimed at all levels of historians. So if you are new to family research, taking your first steps, or you're a pro pouring through the 1950 census, please do check our website or see the links in the chat. And for those of you who are literary sorts, um, we hope you'll come back for our virtual author talks um, presented free of charge in the American Inspiration Author Series. On May 10 at 3 p.m., we'll Zoom overseas to hear from Dennis Duncan, a university lecturer and author in London. He'll take us through the surprising little known history of the book index, revealing how this everyday tool has shaped centuries of knowledge and information. Back in America on May 16, we'll look in depth at the celebrated painter Winslow Homer and his image of America. Author William Cross will be in dialogue with professor and author John Kegg, who is well-versed in our country's cultural history. He's actually a professor of philosophy. 
On June 7 at 3 p.m., we welcome the best-selling author Anne Leary with her new book, The Foundling, a novel based on facts she uncovered in her own family. She'll be joined by Alex Green, a journalist and lecturer at Harvard Kennedy School. Together, they'll look at a dark corner of our country's history, another dark corner, the realm of eugenics in the last century. So back to tonight, um, we thank you, all of us in Boston and from Ann Hyde out in Oklahoma, in Norman at the University of Oklahoma. Um, thank you all of us for joining this evening. We look forward to seeing you again. Our mission at NEHGS is to educate, inspire, and connect. We hope you've done that. And wherever you are, thanks for joining. We'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Ann F. Hyde. Have a good night.